Can we start? Hello, everyone, and good evening. This I'm going to call the call to order this meeting, which is the meeting of the Equity in Access Subcommittee. Madam Secretary, can you do the roll, please? Chairperson, Chairperson Thompson? Here. Ms. Doherty? Here. Mr. Lay? Here. Be present. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited about this meeting. Um, the meeting has a very simple um, forecast a very simple presentation today, but I'm excited about this meeting because as you know Lowell having its diversity really important But we're really working towards equity and access is really important to the three of us that are here today And so with that um, I'm going to ask that I believe it is Miss Phillips um, speak to the um, the culturally and linguistically sustaining practices update. Um, we have, for those of you who are watching, we have had an update prior, so I'm not sure if this is gonna be a synopsis or a shorter, because I know it was a quite long presentation the first time around. Um, so if you have a synopsis, but it's really important for us to hear where we are with this, um, where we can go um, further. I know there was a point where we were also looking towards a position that would, um, be something that we also would want to consider considering the budget season is upon us as well. So um, I will leave the floor to you, Ms. Phillips. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm actually going to get us started and uh, and then <laughs> I leave the floor to you, Dr. Boyd. <laughs> and then I will hand the microphone over to uh, to Ms. Phillips. Uh, if we can get the presentation going. So thank you and thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. So I was looking forward to joining you this evening for many of the same reasons that you uh, mentioned, Madam Chair. And as Ms. Phillips and I were discussing uh, the greatest value to this time and being most effective, most efficient, most productive with the subcommittee, uh, we felt within this context, within the landscape that we find ourselves, uh, to bring us back a minute, to, to raise us back to 20,000 feet, to understand how this notion of uh, culturally and linguistically sustaining practices fits within our framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion overall. Oftentimes, uh, I'm finding, uh, particularly in the past, uh, the past administration in the White House and the politics that found its way through the election of 2020, terminology was being used in a number of ways uh, for a number of purposes not always to advance learning for children. And in some ways, those debates led to some confusion and created some confusion that found, and that confusion found itself right here locally in Lowell. And I found myself during the course of the past couple of years working in some ways to clarify at the same time that we're working to bring awareness overall to the needs of our children within a community as diverse as ours. So, if the committee uh, would indulge me for a few minutes, I would like to be able to share with you our framework for diversity, equity, and inclusion overall, and then hand the microphone over to Ms. Phillips, who can share with you the 
immediate work within the realm of cultural and linguistically sustaining practices. Let's see if we can, let's see if our, is the, do I need another battery? Or am I just not pointing it in the right place? You got it, so I need to point it behind myself. All right, that's gonna be interesting. All right, so as we start with our strategic plan, and our strategic plan, you can see right there in the, in the name of the plan itself, equity, excellence, empowerment, intentionally designed around this notion of equity, that being core to everything that we do. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, there are assumptions made about the role of an equity officer within an organization, particularly as they've become more and more frequently observed in more and more organizations. I'm proud that Lowell Public Schools was the first public uh, office and organization within the city of Lowell to establish an office of equity. And within the office of equity and engagement, strategic planning is part of the functions because of the centrality of the work within the equity office. The analogy we often give for how the equity office functions in Lowell is similar to how you might experience our financial office. There are certain things that work and operate directly within the office of equity, certain things that Ms. Phillips herself and her team are charged with doing uh, day to day, things that they're charged with managing and leading day to day. There are other aspects of the organization where Ms. Phillips herself or her team will be monitoring. There's other aspects where they'll be providing technical assistance and support. Uh, but every aspect of the organization has an element of equity within it because what we're talking about with equity is a justice and fairness for all of our children. Uh, in much the same vein as you think about a financial office, we would hope that there wasn't a need for an auditing component. But we know within our work here, uh, we've, we've come to understand and everyone accepts as a rule that there's a ne necessity for an auditing function. We would all hope that there wouldn't be a need for us to have a central function around justice and fairness. But what we know over time, what we've heard and learned and experienced is that not only is there a need, there's a critical need for that work now and into the future. And so the work that Ms. Phillips and her team does is a direct extension of the work that happens through the office of the superintendent, much like you see with the work that we've all become accustomed to of the work through a financial office, just instead of working on dollars and accounting and procurement, Ms. Phillips and her team are working around this notion of justice and fairness for all of our families, all of our children, each and every day. And so our core beliefs, you can see, bullet number one, a high quality education is a fundamental civil right of every child that we serve. And so, Madam Chair, as you were saying, Lowell Public Schools is the second most diverse linguistically community in the Commonwealth. Over 70 languages spoken. Our diversity truly is the greatest asset that our community has. And leveraging that diversity is, again, core to everything that we're doing in order to bring about improvements for our students. So within the strategic plan, we've established and we've codified, the committee codified its commitment to equity within the plan itself to find what those commitments were. Eliminating the racial, ethnic, and linguistic achievement and opportunity gaps among all students, providing equitable funding and resources among the district's diverse schools, and engaging all families with courtesy, dignity, respect, and cultural understanding. So getting beyond this notion of equity as an umbrella term and defining what we mean by equity within Lowell Public Schools was an important first step that was taken within our strategic planning process. But with that commitment, we need to translate that into actions because all of the great work that is happening and all of the greatness that has been achieved within Lowell Public Schools, while it's been experienced by a good many children and a good many families, unfortunately it hasn't been experienced by all of our families all of the time. And as you look at the data, it's our diverse populations that oftentimes, particularly our Hispanic and Latinx community, that's experiencing significant gaps in performance regardless of what data set you're looking at. And here, this is FY21. We're now going into and planning for FY23. 
But I think we can all understand, even though the data is not as readily available in the context of COVID-19, that there's no aspect of COVID-19 that naturally would have narrowed these gaps. Instead, what we found is that students that were at higher risk, students that were uh, performing at lower levels, those gaps have grown. They haven't narrowed during this context of COVID-19 that had us moving to remote learning, which is not our default mechanism for providing instruction. We're far better at doing what we do really well, which is in-person learning. And last year was an entire year of remote learning. This year, we saw and followed that data all the way across. We saw how it was playing out in terms of quarantining relating to chronic absenteeism, uh, staffing shortages relating to uh, shortages in substitutes, access to school through shortages in bus drivers, all became a question. And we should be able to make uh, or draw an informed inference here that even though the data sets may not be comparable, we should expect to see, as we have seen, as we look at these data sets, that these gaps in performance, in outcomes, in opportunities are not narrowing, which means we need to accelerate our work even further, accelerate it even more going forward, each opportunity that we have. And we do have an opportunity here of a positive budget outlook, a positive fiscal outlook. So again, Madam Chair, I appreciate you raising that to the surface. So as we define equity and understanding that in this umbrella term that often is put out there of equality, equity and equality are in some ways different, and in some ways they are relational. We say there's equity in services in order to get to equality in outcomes. And here, this is another image. Oftentimes we use the image of uh, the youngsters standing on uh, the boxes looking at the game. So this is another image. We didn't create the image. I just felt like it, it might be beneficial to give another image here that basically shows the same thing. You see there's two different sides of this particular town. One side that's underserved in the left picture and uh, then, the, then the, what I'm looking at on the right side depends on how you're looking at your screen. There's a, but if you see there on the picture that's on the left that says equality, that would be the community resources moving in the same proportion to both sides of this particular graphical town, yet one side of the town had been historically underserved, and you can see there are less resources there already, which then if, you serve, if we're serving or providing or distributing resources in an equal way, essentially what we should expect is that those gaps in services will continue to exist. So the picture on equity shows that the resources in this particular graphical image would need to be provided at an increased level to one side of the town in order to bring about equality and outcomes or opportunities for both sides of that particular community. So, and this one, I like, the, I like this particular image because it, it went further to, often, to also assert uh, that we've got to target strategies to focus on gains for those most marginalized, move beyond services into changes in policies, institutions, and structures. So those of you that are familiar with the, the youngsters standing on the boxes, just a different version of the same concept here visually. All right, so how do we translate those commitments that we said, our fundamental commitments into action across the district? We've got three, uh, a three-pronged approach clear expectations for performance, relevant and collaborative support, and meaningful feedback and accountability. You'll see none of these specifically say CLSP. None of them specifically say culturally and linguistically sustaining practices. You'll see how those fit in us translating the actions we need to take across the district. So if we look at the first one with clear expectations for performance, what we look to here is our community as a whole. What's our community telling us that it's seeking, that it's needing by way of justice and fairness. And this will not be a surprise to you, even though the graphic is likely new to you. And I want to preface this by saying this is just a sample graphic that I'll be able to explain a little bit further as you get to next steps. But it, it's a visual representation to share with you the direction we're trying to go, where you see that first quote, what gets measured gets done. You've heard me say that time and time again. Those of you that uh, had the opportunity to interview me, I think you remember me using that quote because I truly do believe it. I think most people that have led large-scale organizations understand that to be true. And when I say it's a community-based framework, these are the areas that we've heard from the community that are needs within our organization and across our community as we talk about this notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So 
the opportunity gaps, again, the outcomes that we're seeing across and with all among our diverse populations that I just mentioned previously. Language access, committee member Lay uh, has been a, a, a staunch proponent of translation and interpretation services uh, uh, on a regular basis. He comes to me individually and has mentioned here within this room the need to ensure that all families get access to information in, again, an equitable way based on their language at home. Uh, and Committee Member Lay has brought some pretty um, vivid examples of how we're not meeting that in certain instances. But language access, uh, as Committee Member Lay speaks to it, he's not speaking from uh, a personal standpoint, he's speaking as a representative of the community, as community members come to him. And we've certainly heard that time and time again, that language access is a necessary component of our framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity hiring, uh, Committee Member Thompson, you. You've mentioned it since joining the committee in January and even in our conversations prior to you coming on the committee uh, to the need for us to have a staff that truly reflects the community as a whole. And again, not speaking from yourself as an individual, but speaking on behalf of the community members that you represent. And then the culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, that's, Ms. Phillips will get into a discussion there. But it, talking through the fact that one person brings one background and we are now, as staff members within an educational institution, we're serving family members that come from over 70 linguistically diverse backgrounds and understanding all of the cultures that we are supporting here within the community, the cultures that are similar to our background as well as the cultures that are vastly different from our own personal background and having an understanding and an awareness of not only ourselves, what we bring to the table and our biases, but also all of the children who are in front of us on any given day. Uh, so this comes together in the notion of what gets measured gets done. What we're building towards here is you can think along the lines of how we accredit high schools and colleges across the country. Here's an, an opportunity for us to look and monitor in the same way. Again, non-evaluative or punitive, but simply monitoring our progress towards achieving a true equitable and inclusive environment that is responsive to the diversity and supportive of the diversity within our classrooms. You heard uh, Mr. Skinner, those of you that took part in the Performance Management Subcommittee, talking about the opportunity to partner with UMass Lowell around building out a room, more robust data system. This would be right within that partnership. However, it works through our equity office. So this would be something that is supported and in many ways led through our equity office, but again, cuts across all of the departments within Lowell Public Schools, and this would be a core component of that partnership, which you'll again see come to you at the, uh, within our budget recommendation that'll be coming up next week, that partnership to build out a more robust uh, data system that allows us to create, use, and put forward tools such as this. So you will see adjustments as we work through, and you'll see that within our next steps. But again, at the top, what gets measured gets done. We've got to get beyond talking about our commitments and make sure that we're moving forward by delivering on those commitments. And then a rele relevant and collaborative support for continuous improvement. So looking at that framework again, many of these things here you've seen, you've heard, you've uh, supported, and in some cases championed that the work that's happening within our district. Uh, talking again about the budget cycle right there within the opportunity gaps, fair student funding. One of the first large-scale systemic change initiatives that we undertook when I first came on as superintendent was shifting our entire funding mechanism and resource allocation system from one that was based on a staffing allocation model to one that's built on the needs of our students. Student-based budgeting, we call fair student funding, to ensure all of our students get the resources that they need when they need them, and all of our schools have the resources to bring about that improvement. And you can go through each of these bullets. These are not a list. This is organizing the comprehensive work that we're doing within the organization. Again, some of it that's, uh, some of it that's being led. You missing the visual? All right. Some of it that's being led through the equity office. Some of it that's being monitored through the equity office. Some of it that's being supported through the equity office. Again, because it cuts across our entire organization. And I know this uh, subcommittee understands that well. Um, um, being a bit redundant with that to help our overall community understand the centrality of the work. It's not ancillary, it's not supplemental, it is core to the work that we do across the school district. 
A significant amount of work, as you know, is being undertaken within diversity hiring. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe you've been participating in some of that work directly. Again, important aspects of, of the work we're doing to bring about equity and inclusion across the district so that we can truly leverage the diversity that is so rich and valuable to our community. That fourth box there around the culture and linguistically sustaining practices, again, I'm going to speed through it because Ms. Phillips is going to come back and be able to engage in, a, uh, in some dialogue with the subcommittee on that particular component. But if you think about this as a framework, as a matrix, right now we're referring to them as quadrants because there happens to be four of them. Any feedback from the committee if we're, not, if we're missing something in terms of what we're hearing from the community? Because this is not a research-based framework. This is a community-based framework. What makes sense within our context? What are we hearing from our families that we need to focus on, we need to, do, we need to monitor, we need to change in order to get better to serve our community? And these are the areas that we've heard from, that we've been working towards uh, for the last three years. And uh, again, the opportunity gaps, language access, diversity hiring, culture and linguistically sustaining practices, they all come together. They are interrelated. While we often talk about them independent of one another. We have to understand the interrelatedness in order to truly get after the complex needs of our community. So then the meaningful feedback and accountability, again, how it's all interrelated. What does accountability mean? Now we look to an accountability framework here that cuts across, again, every aspect of accountability within our organization to ensure aligned accountability. Now this is a research-based framework. Uh, it, it may seem old, 1999, that's, that's now quite old, but it's still the best one I've seen. And we, did a, we do adapt the terminology, uh, but I think it's important to give credit uh, where credit's due. So even though the, the terminology is different, the concept has been adapted uh, from Abelman and Elmore. So individual responsibility, who we're hiring into the district, who we're retaining into the district, ensuring that they understand their individual responsibility to be connected to those commitments that we make as an organization because that individual responsibility, what each person brings, needs to be aligned with and complementary to the collective expectations of the organization. And that needs to be aligned with how we're monitoring and evaluating both programs and individual performance. When we have alignment of all three of those factors, that's what we call aligned accountability. When there's a lack of alignment in any one of those, that's where we work towards challenges in performance. We've got to identify where those gaps are, whether they're within the individual, within the collective, or within our evaluation system in order to bring about the improvement in terms of feedback and accountability. And we know it's necessary to results. Pat Summit happens to be a legendary basketball coach. Uh, she has since passed, uh, but responsibility equals accountability equals ownership, and a sense of ownership is the most powerful weapon a team or organization can have. And if somebody knows something about winning, I would say it's Pat Summit, and I think she says it quite well from a completely different perspective than organizational change that Abelman and Elmore are speaking to. But quite frankly, if you ask me, it seems to be completely uh, one in the same. So then what's our next steps here? In each of those areas, we have some next steps. And you can see this is uh, logically aligned here so that I can hand the microphone over to Ms. Phillips to get more in depth on today's agenda. But we've got some work that we have to do around what we're currently calling the LPS DEI model school dashboard, which we're fairly excited about. We're not aware of any other community that's moving in that direction as boldly to put out our commitments in terms of data that's monitored, where we are opening up both our successes and our challenges and moving in a direction, again, that's non-evaluative, but moving in a direction that's progress-oriented and collaborative. Again, using that, uh, uh, the best, again, the best analogy I have of the school accreditation process. We've got to update our school-by-school -school staffing opportunity analyses. Uh, you may he have heard about this before that we talk about our, um, we've called it a, a diversity staffing index previously. This is, a, this is a, a tool that Ms. Phillips' office is working in conjunction with our HR office uh, to bring about, again, clear data monitoring and visualization so that we can make informed decisions to ensure that we have the, t the complementary teaming within our schools of staffing that reflects our students. 
Collaboration with school leaders on uh, the QIP development and CLSP goal setting. You'll hear again, Ms. Phillips will share a, a bit about that with, uh, with you. The UMass Lowell partnership to align our performance management tools. You're gonna, you've heard some of that from Mr. Skinner. That is going to be an investment that we're uh, going to be recommending to the school committee as part of the partnership, uh, as part of the budget, I'm sorry, the partnership with UMass Lowell to bring about more robust and usable data for our schools that certainly includes within it uh, the aligned dashboard of the LPS DEI model school dashboard with the school performance scorecards that you heard Mr. Skinner talking about at the school performance subcommittee. And then the phase two of the multi-year cross-disciplinary CLSP plan. Reason that I put that as the last bullet, it, it has generated, I would say, the majority of discussion around uh, our framework for, for ensuring equity and inclusion within our schools to leverage the diversity that uh, within this community. Uh, but it is one aspect of it. It's one aspect of it. And it's important to understand the in interrelatedness of everything that we're doing to support the centrality of equity within our schools. Uh, I'm going to stay in case there's any questions uh, that I might be able to support. But at this point, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I'm going to hand the, uh, both the remote and the microphone over to Ms. Phillips and allow her to engage you in a conversation on CLSP specifically. Before you do that, I just want to give an opportunity for my colleagues. If you would have any questions for Dr. Boyd, if you have any comments that you'd like to share. I'm not sure if either of you. Yeah. All set? All right. Excellent. Doc Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Um, so thank you, Ms. Tom Tom Thompson and school committee members. Um, so I, I appreciate Dr. Boyd being here and opening the subcommittee. I think a lot of times people think the equity office is an add-on office when really it cuts across every aspect of the organization. And in order for um, an, an organization to truly prioritize equity, it really needs to be at the top levels all throughout the organization, including school committee, but especially superintendent, you know, across the board, you know, teachers, staff, everyone. So I think it was important to hear that commitment from, you know, our, our leader that this is something that the full district is committed to. Um, I want to go back to, to one of the slides. Um, I think you have it in your, in your handout. It was the four quadrants, the DEI. Okay, so I'd like to specifically speak about um, this bottom right quadrant, culturally and linguistically sustaining practices. Um, as, as Dr. Boyd mentioned, our equity office leads certain areas, um, collaborates with other offices in certain areas, and monitors certain areas. So there's a role for the equity office in all of these areas. One of the areas that the equity office leads is the culturally and linguistically sustaining practices. Um, in the presentation I shared in February, um, I, I helped to define what are culturally responsive practices, which are different from culturally sustaining practices. I do want to mention the difference because we have identified culturally sustaining practices as what we're working toward. And um, sustaining practices means that we are elevating all cultures, all languages. There's not one dominant culture um, that's prevalent in, in our school system, you know, in our instructional practices, in our curriculum. Um, and, and that's important to note because culturally responsive education is good. You know, it, it's good because it sets high expectations for students, right? Um, it uses culture as a way to help students acquire um, academic skills, but it's not necessarily saying all cultures are equal or all languages are equal. Um, we also have a commitment toward linguistically sustaining practices. And again, when we say sustaining, that means um, we are maintaining languages. You're not coming and leaving your language at the door. Um, whereas a, a linguistically responsive you know, education is helping you to move toward um, you know, achieving what you need to in English, right? 
undeniably, that's, that is a requirement, you know, for success in our system. However, maintaining um, the richness of your other languages or acquiring other languages is also part of, of um, you know, us, us being, um, you know, a, a diverse system. You know, it's, it's great to sit beside someone who's different from you, who comes from a different culture, who speaks a different language, and it's another thing to, to truly understand that um, all of us have, you know, wh what we bring to the table is equal, right? And, um, and we should see that reflected in our, in our school system. I, I say all that because it's not easy to do this work across 28 schools, hundreds of staff, um, you know, 50 school leaders, right? Um, there is a continuum of cultural responsiveness and everyone's at a different level on that continuum. I think that as we um, continue to strengthen our, our hiring practices, um, we can hire in for skill sets that, that, that um, that are already culturally responsive, right? But right now, we meet everyone where you're at, and we try to move you along the continuum. Um, that's the work that we've started um, and prioritized this year with our school leaders, um, understanding what is racism, what is bias, what is cultural responsiveness, um, you know, understanding identity. Who are you? Every single one of us has identity, has culture. Um, so it's important to understand who you are right, in order to then understand who you serve and how others are different. Um, so, so that's been the focus of our leadership, but we have not as a system gone into the school buildings, right? And the most successful training really is um, on site and embedded within one's practice. And I think that, that um, that's where we're going with the phase two, now that we've helped to get leaders prepared for for um, leading in their school building. Um, this year we did ask all of our school buildings, our school leaders, to include a culturally and linguistically sustaining practices um, goal within their um, quality improvement plans. And they, we didn't narrow it to, to one single thing. You know, we did ask, look at your population, look at your needs, and then what are you going to focus on? Um, and another thing, another ask of the school buildings was around bias and curriculum and how um, it's important that every school goes through at least one cycle of, of um, identifying, um, of, of assessing whether there's bias in curriculum, not just the physical curriculum, but also in the instructional practice, how are you delivering the curriculum. Um, and so that is something that we've asked that I've asked all schools to prepare next year. You know, we're gonna learn the, the tool, we're gonna implement the tool, tool, and we're gonna identify school-wide whether there's bias in our curriculum. Um, where we're going is that every teacher really should understand the tool and be able to do self-reflection on their own units, right, on their own lessons that they're delivering um, to identify where there might be bias. And, and a lot of times it's not even intentional, right? So it's important to understand what bias is, especially unintentional bias, to have a tool to identify, you know, oh, I'm a reading teacher. Everything I've read has come from one culture, you know, representations from, from one place um, or lots of animals, <laughs> right? And then think about what, where do I need to balance? So, but getting to every single teacher is a heavy lift. Um, and so, in order to, to be successful and to bring this into schools, um, last year I did recommend the Cultural Ling and Linguistically Sustaining Practices Coordinator, um, someone who can be closer to the work in schools, um, someone who is closer to having been in a classroom, um, to be able to advise other teachers as well as school leaders on you know, their goal, where they're at, and then how do we move um, leaders and teachers across the continuum. Um, even with the request for, for one position, um, 
given the number of schools we have, that's still a big ask, but I think it's a starting point. And, um, and again, this, this is someone who would be embedded in the schools, you know, more so than in central office, and really able to provide more coaching support, um, you know, within, within our schools. Um, one other thing I want to mention that's important, the, the direction for, for this work, is also having guidelines for, for schools. Because some schools um, do have the capacity to do their own internal training. And there's at least three schools that have conducted pretty regular trainings, month-to-month um, -month trainings. And it's important for us to have common definitions, um, common expectations of what are the foundational trainings that are needed, right? The identity, the bias, prejudice, you know, how are we defining it? What's that baseline learning? Um, you know, there's an adaptive piece and then there's a technical piece and we wanna be able to address um, both of those pieces. So that's, that's all I wanted to share from the presentation that I did in February. But as you see, this is a piece of what Dr. Boyd shared as our bigger vision for for equity, and and I would also I shared the um, the job description that had been shared last year. I didn't make any changes to it, but it was placed into a um, I forget what the yes yeah, suspension account. <laughs> and I you know I, I I would ask that we consider pulling it out. I do think um, to get the the best qualified person. Um, a lot of people are making decisions right now around what they want to do or where they want to go or who might want to come here. And I think that delaying this could put us into a second tier of hiring versus being up, you know, in front of getting the best qualified person. Excellent. I have things to say, but I, was, I would defer to my colleagues if you guys have anything you would like to share. Any questions you um, have for Ms. Phillips? Yeah, thank you. I, I do have a question on this position. Um, Ms. Phillips, uh, could you just explain to me in a simple to understand how, how the, this individual be um, uh, working with the uh, hundreds and thousands of students, I mean teachers uh, within our system? How, how are we going to do that? So this person won't be able to reach every single teacher, but we'll have to strategically understand, um, you know, which teams, who's ready for what, right? So this past year, um, there, were, there was a school team that said, we want to do this ourselves, but we just need support. We need someone to meet with us um, weekly to kind of advise us on our curriculum and, um, you know, to think through, you know, help us support our facilitation. Um, so in that case, they wanted to do it, they just need the support in doing it. There are other schools that might say, I don't know how to do this, um, I need more intensive training. So this isn't a one size fits all, and I'm not gonna pretend that this one position is going to be enough. The question is, what can we meaningfully do with this position? You know, we set some goals for this position, we monitor and evaluate our goals, and then likely we come back, you know, in future years um, based on what we've monitored, evaluated, and learned. But right now, it's w the need is wide open, and we just need to start kind of chipping away at, at the need. Thank you. So, um, so how do we expect the result of this um, of this position, and also is this position a a temporary like during COVID, um, or or this position going to be permanent? Uh, and um, what do we expect the result from this person to help the students? Mm -hmm. So I I think the opportunity is right now, right? The funding is right now, but with anything, if you monitor and you achieve the results, then you're able to, you know, make a case for why something needs to continue 
or in some cases, maybe you don't need to continue. So this is the opportunity right now. It is the need right now. Um, there are ways, as, as Dr. Boyd mentioned, the, the, um, the metrics, right? We can do surveys. Um, we can do student feedback to see if they're seeing the, the um, improvements happening in their classroom. So, and then there's, there's the, um, I don't want to call it check the box, but it is, there are some things that you have to do, right? So can we say across the board that every teacher has had a training on understanding identity, understanding bias, right? So those are some things that we can measure as it happened. And then the more meaningful uh, measurements are because it happened, what changed? So if, if I could, Madam Chair, uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Lay, you're going to hear through our budget recommendation how we're planning to manage for sustainability and across and mitigate the fiscal cliff that is inevitable at the conclusion of ESSER. My recommendation right now is that this position would be within our general fund, not funded through ESSER for sustainability purposes. Across time, we're going to be moving more of those uh, investments that the committee desires to sustain from ESSER into the general fund. Uh, anything that you started to invest, and you remember the many conversations that uh, uh, Ms. Turner's facilitated for the committee around fund management. That's the notion of fund management, ensuring that we're investing out of the proper fund at the right time for the needs of the district. So you're, you're correct, Mr. Lay, that when this was originally proposed, it was proposed within ESSER, again, as a pilot initiative. Where we are now, based on the fact that the committee moved to suspense, Ms. Phillips has been working to sustain this through her office, more with her direct involvement. There's a need to move into phase two. There's an even increased need for this position. And given what we've learned through this year and based on where the Student Opportunity Act is and the funding flexibility for the committee, um, I would expect that I'm going to be recommending to you next week that this is funded through the general fund, not through ESSER uh, for sustainability purposes. But again, through fund management, that's flexibility that the committee has as to which fund it uses to uh, fund which investments. Committee Member Doherty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have to say I'm someone who from the outset was very much in favor of all this work that we're trying to do with the diversity hiring, with the being culturally responsive in our teachings and in our curriculum. Um, I also was someone who voted to put it in the suspense account because it was another management level position when we're very much focused on direct services to our students. Uh, but from what I've seen, the, um, the, the meetings I've been able to attend, and they've all been on Zoom, um, I know there was one, I want to say it was last year on a Saturday maybe, it was very impressive to hear from our teachers. And I don't know if you participated, if you saw that one, because you weren't on the committee at that time. But to hear our teachers and staff talking about what they had learned and about what they had seen. And one thing that came right to the top for me in all this was that we needed the professional trainers, that many of our teachers were putting in hours and hours of their own time. And, and staff, too. I don't want to just say it was teachers who were doing it, because I know it was across the district. Um, and to have somebody who has that professional expertise mm -hmm. to uh, lead those meetings, and like you said, depending on what the needs are for the different schools, I see that as being something we need to do as a next step. So I have, uh, let's say, my, uh, my opinion about the position has evolved, mm -hmm. that I see that we are ready to move forward. That said, I've got questions about what the dashboard is going to provide us in terms of information, the data we're looking at. I mean, one of the things that Dr. Boyd talked about was, you know, if you measure it, I forget the second half of the phrase, sorry, <laughs> you can change it or whatever, um, that to know that it's going to be not that surveys and uh, polling our staff, polling our students are important, but really hard data. What are we expecting to see change from this effort? And I know that it's the achievement gap. That's what we're talking about. So that would be attendance. That would be um, going on to college. Great. All those things, we want to see those things be moving as part of the dashboard. So I, I am, like I said, I'm, I'm in favor of moving forward with this. 
Um, when I look at the job description, you know, I have my, you know, um, I guess it was nine years in recruitment uh, where I have a, I look at job descriptions very, from a different perspective, right? Um, and one of the things that jumped out right away when you talk about professional responsibilities, you've got that line in the very last sentence of the paragraph before you go into specific requirements. The majority of the CLSP coordinator's time will be planning and delivering professional development sessions and evaluating progress with staff and other coaches. Exactly what we need. Exactly what we need to do the train the trainer model, mm -hmm. right? So our staff come to these very professional, thought out um, experiences, ready to learn, self reflect, all those pieces. So that piece of the work is done for them. So that's important to me. But when you look under qualifications preferred, there's two bullets there that I think really need to be under qualifications, not preferred. Mm -hmm. The first one is the first bullet experience and demonstrated expertise as a classroom teacher. We need someone who's been teaching because you know part of this is going to be buy-in. How do we get buy-in from our staff that have been here forever and now people are saying, you know what, you need to unpack some of your bias that you might not even, most of us aren't aware that we have them until we do that hard work of really looking at ourselves. They're going to need somebody in the position that they can respect that has been a teacher, that has been on the front lines. I would move that one to qualification, not preferred. And the third bullet, demonstrated success working with teachers and administrators as a professional development provider, mm -hmm. team leader and or facilitator. We've said this is the bulk of the work. I want someone that has that. I think those two bullets need to be under qualifications and not under preferred so that we are ensuring that we get someone highly qualified to do this very important work and to get the buy-in we're going to need across the district. Um, and that would be, with, that, with that, those changes, you got me. I'm 100% behind moving forward with this. Um, I mean, unless something else comes out of me that I haven't <laughs> thought of yet. I'm not putting it in writing. And, and I do want to learn more about what the dashboard, what are we committing to in terms of measurable outcomes. But other than that, I, I have seen the work that's happened in the last couple of years. I have been impressed by it. And I know that our staff have had to do a lot of that on their own. I know teachers personally who went out mm -hmm. and bought all these books and sharing the readings with me and, you know, and it's like, and that's great, but not everybody's going to be that incentivized. We need to bring to them somebody who can deliver the, that information. So that's really where I am on this issue. And I thank you for the, the, <laughs> the time to let me express it. Well, I appreciate it because I'm actually really pretty much on the same page. Um, I do agree with those two changes in the qualifications because those are two things that actually had jumped out to me. Um, I think that you absolutely need a, a classroom teacher, somebody who's been in the trenches. You know, as somebody who was a teacher, you absolutely need somebody who has developed their own curriculum, understands how that functions, um, has been in the classroom because it's great to have somebody who's been a facilitator, but if they haven't actually been in that space, one, as a teacher, I'm like, mm, I'm not really necessarily knowing that they understand what that's like because it's different to be a facilitator in a professional environment and in a school environment. Very, very different. Um, and as a facilitator, that's, that's, a very, uh, that's something that I hold dear. Um, I have to say I'm encouraged by the work um, that has been done. Um, you know, I know that it's, it's tough and it, is, it feels like a lot when we're looking at it in the scope of what needs to be done. But one of the things that you said that really stuck with me is we have to chip away at it. And I think that we have to make a commitment to it. Um, you know, I'm really proud that to be on the school committee where racism was de declared a public health crisis. Um, very important for me, which is actually part of why I ran. Um, important for me to be amongst colleagues that believe in equity and the importance of equity and not just diversity. So that is, a, is um, really something that um, I know that this role 
is very necessary, um, having seen the work that teachers are trying to do on their own and needing that additional support and needing somebody that can literally help them shape their train the trainer model or um, you know, give them that, that fundamental support that they need in order to be successful. Because again, there are teachers that probably want to do the work. They have no idea where to get started. They're intimidated and they don't want to do the wrong thing um, because it could be causing more trauma to do the wrong thing. So I think that there's that component of it. So this person needs to one, get Lowell, get, you know, understand what um, the 70, the fact that there are 70 strong languages and cultures that need to be represented. And I also want to say, Ms. Phillips, I appreciate you talking about the difference between culturally responsive and culturally sustainable because in talking to lots of people, I don't think that they've heard those differences and they are quite stark and they are necessary to have the, the breakdown of that. I would say I would like to make a motion to bring this position, take this out of suspense, the sp suspense account, and bring it to our colleagues. Um, you want me to make that one? Oh, chair. yes. Oh, as chair, I probably can't make the motion. So I'd like you to make the motion. <laughs> I, I would be happy to make that motion in support of the subcommittee. Uh, it would be to, but first piece of it would mm -hmm. be to move those two bullet Correct. items to the qualifications mm -hmm. column, mm -hmm. not preferred, mm -hmm. and then to request that we uh, move that out of the suspense account and move forward with posting for the position. And, uh, may, I, may I ask the opinion from the superintendent by moving those two uh, items up to qualifications? Would that pose a problem? I, I don't anticipate it uh, causing a challenge with those two moving up to the qualifications, uh, to the required, qual required qualifications as opposed to preferred. Uh, I think there's also been a, a a lot of flexibility on the part of the committee within this staffing shortage environment that we find ourselves in that if we find that to be for some reason any type of obstacle we can bring it back to the committee Correct. for adjustment at that time but committee so committee member lay i appreciate the the ask but i would i don't anticipate a challenge at this particular time okay. and i think thank getting you. it posted in a timely way would be what's most beneficial to our district right. thank you i second it then Excellent. And now you go. if i can just add to that the timing really is critical. So, so I absolutely support, you know, a teacher, you know, and teaching experience. I think when it was initially proposed, um, you know, in the field, right, in the field, we have really strong um, experts, you know, and diversity, mm -hmm. ex equity, and inclusion who have not been in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so it was like just, you know, casting a broad net, but I absolutely support um, you know, the classroom teacher, like we are a school district, so that was always important, you know. So I just want to say yes, the, that, that's a great addition, but the time that it was put there, you know, it is just acknowledging in the field that there are a lot of great, great um, DEI practitioners that have not had the opportunity to teach in a classroom. Do I need to second it? No. no you <laughs> so I, I know. You seconded it, I think. Oh, you're seconded it. So yes. I know Miss uh, Miss Hillary Clark had been. Uh, a big supporter of this, uh, mm -hmm. so I, I'm sure she's going to be very happy that uh, we bring this. Uh, she absolutely here, will, honest. absolutely. Um, well, I'm really excited about. Um, I'm excited about that. Do, do either of my colleagues have anything that they would like to add? I think you do. Do, do I need to do a roll call, Madam yes. Secretary? Yes. Okay, roll call, please. Chairperson Thompson. Yes. Ms. Doherty. Yes. Mr. Lay. Yes. Three A's approved. Excellent. All right, well, I think that this was pretty much the entire, unless anybody has anything else to add, I believe this was the purpose of this meeting. I'm glad that in the direction that we're moving, um, and I would, oh, yeah. Just one quick question. When do you think we'll get more information about the dashboard, and how, what data you envision us being able to get? So the, there's some work that needs to be undertaken that uh, Ms. Phillips will be facilitating through her office, but we're hopeful that the committee might uh, support the partnership with UMass Lowell, and we're looking forward to getting also the benefit of that thought partnering through their research office and their data office and at UMass Lowell as part of our overarching performance management system. Uh, so there's two parts that would need to take place. Uh, and if you're okay with that, Committee Member Doherty, I would like to engage those two parts before providing you a, a defi definite timeline. Uh, but this is a core part of our data management strategy and a core part of this. So you'll be hearing on an ongoing basis and um, sooner rather than later might be the best I can give you in terms of specifics as we await the budget. Excellent. 
all hearts and minds. Do you have? Motion to oh, I was going. I was going to make that motion. <laughs> Go ahead. I can't make a motion. <laughs> all right. So motion to adjourn. <laughs> I don't want to act second. It, 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 it goes so well. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, meeting adjourned. <laughs>